Good morning, everyone. This is Chelsea Jones. I'm with Illinois WorkNet. I just want to um, get this thing started since it is 10 o'clock. Um, to get started, can you please um, let me know if you can hear me? Um, you can either type in the chat or raise your hand. There's a little guy above that notepad. Um, the note's at the top, and um, if you click it, it'll show that you can hear me. Okay, great. Looks good. Um, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items before I turn it over to DCEO. Um, first off, if you are listening via your computer speakers, great. But if you do have any problems with that, you can call in to our conference number. And if you do that, make sure to mute your computer speakers. And if you do call in, we do have everyone muted just um, to cut down on background noise. You can chat amongst yourselves in the chat pod. I see some people have already introduced themselves, and that's great. We also have all of the materials in a file share pod for downloading, which is in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, we have the PowerPoint, the um, RFA, the clarification, and then something else that they're going to go over during the webinar. So you can just click on each one and download the files to your computer. And um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute the CEO so they can go ahead and get started. Mike, are you ready? Uh, he had to step out for a moment and he'll... Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, this is Mike Baker at DCO. I've got uh, Gary Eichen with me and We're on the call on Friday. Oh, good. All right. Hey, we've got repeat business. That is good. Okay, great. So then All right. Okay, we will get underway now. Um Let me scroll down my window here, and okay, now I can do this. Okay, so why are we doing this? Um, here's why. Um, this wasn't our idea, but this is uh, kind of what we've been able to work uh, out with DOL and the National Evaluator for the Workforce Innovation Fund Run, Run Project. If you look at uh, the slide that's up now, if any, any of you were at the bidders conferences in December, you'll remember this slide. Um, you know, the evaluation is the thing on this whole initiative. Um, everything has to be statistically sound, uh, treatment control group, and then you know, measure the difference between those groups. You know, we have gone over that kind of ad nauseum um, since we found out that that's the way that we had to go. So. Initially, when we talked with the National Evaluator, we spoke to them uh, about the people have the flexibility to try different things, and we would have you know multiple opportunities for innovation, um, and you're just casting a wider net essentially. Well, even though we had that conversation on the front side. Uh, at some point, enough people looked at it and started getting concerned that there was a little bit too much latitude in that. Specifically, the National Evaluator and DOL became concerned that there was too much variety, and that would require multiple control groups for each region. So you know, every re if each region did its own thing, each region would have to have its own um, control group. And then they were concerned that we wouldn't have enough people to be statistically significant, and then at the end of the day we would do all this and not really be able to have any kind of meaningful evaluation come out of it uh, other than anecdotal stuff. Uh, and you know, as we've spoken about, anecdotal stuff is not what they're looking for. You know, they want you know, to run the t-tests and the z-tests and all that good stuff that most of us have forgotten from college statistics. 
So what were we, were we able to work out with them? We were able to keep acceleration of time to earning as the overall goal. You know, the overall goal has been, you know, let's see how fast we can get folks through the system. You know, from the time we get them in, assess what they've got, and then get them out, trained and out the door and into a paying job as quickly as possible. So that is still the overall goal. We were also able to keep the overall regional partnership model that you all have been working on so hard. So the work you've done investing in local partners or regional partners uh, still you know, has value. You know, that was not wasted effort. You're still going to utilize those folks that you've been talking to all along. So you know, for us, that was, that was a good thing to be able to keep, keep in the mix. Also, you know, we're So we're, we're, that's staying as part of the mix. And then we're also you know, keeping that flexibility to try to find ways to get folks through as quickly as possible. So what do we have to give up? We had to give up each region doing its own thing. So um, the new application deadline and the clarification is pretty clear. It's the uh, end of the business day, uh, the last Friday in March, March 29th. And you still send in the uh, applications to my email address. Okay, so if we're not going to do it the way we initially talked about in December, how are we going to do it? Well, on the, the concept of acceleration of time to earning, we realize that the speed of trying to lay this on is somewhat problematic for the community colleges um, because of the credit issue. The idea here is that uh, we want to try this on a non-credit basis so that those of you that are community college folks have the latitude you know, to think innovatively and get outside the box a little bit. You don't have to go through the lengthy curricular process, um, curricular approval process, that is, and can do some things that are, that are a little bit more innovative. However, if you can find a way to do it and allow the folks to earn college credit, we strongly encourage that. And if, if you're batting around ideas, um, you know, work with, with uh, the staff, uh, with Jim. Um, but again, it, it's not required. You know, there is, you know, some work to, that goes uh, into making that happen. So, you know, we're very comfortable with doing it on the non-credit side. But again, if you can find a way to do it with credit, so much the better. And LeVon has a point. Um, just real quickly, remember that non-credit is also uh, 1.6. So for those of you in the community college system, so it, um, vocational credit. Uh, just by show of hands, uh, could we have folks that are uh, community college uh, staff just raise your hand real quick so we can get a feel for who's here? Oh, good. No, Quite a few. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, on an acceleration of time to earning, we want to eliminate the dead time that is built into the traditional academic calendar. Um, students that are going through on the traditional path, coming out of high school, going, they don't mind that dead time. You know, spring break, holiday break, um, whatever else. You know, they don't mind that uh, because they're on the four-year plan and, and, and they want to go out and blow off steam. That's great. However, dislocated workers need to get back to work as soon as possible. You know, they have families to feed. So we're trying to f encourage everyone to find a way to eliminate that dead time so that folks can go through just as quickly as absolutely possible. And we also want to work with the employers uh, on an ongoing with those employers so that we know what's coming up down the pike in the next few weeks. And so everybody's kind of ready and as soon as one cohort starts, you're already planning what you're going to do with the next one and, and when, when you're going to put those folks through the process. And uh, the third item on this page is one of the most important, and that is the idea of open exit. 
we want someone to be able to move on up the program as soon as they demonstrate the competency on what it is they're trying to learn, whether it's uh, uh, part of a bridge or part of uh, the training itself, but especially in the bridge phase where we're looking at folks that, to enter the program that have reading and math at least sixth grade level. And then by the time they're done with that and go out into a job, they're at least at uh, ninth and tenth grade level, uh, ninth uh, math, tenth reading. So someone might only need a week of brush up to pass, you know, to get their scores up to ninth and tenth grade. Uh, I don't know if I could go in and pass that test right now without brushing up. But the idea is that if, if let's say the bridge program traditionally ran for two months, if somebody can get up to speed. all the way to the end before they move on. As soon as they show that they have grasped what it is they were there to get, let's move them out and up the ladder so that you know, they're not wasting time um, going over stuff that they've already demonstrated a competency for. And we will work with you all and the Manufacturing Learning Exchange to develop competency checklists so those can be used when uh, determining eligibility for the program, and again, when determining um, are they ready to exit out of training, and then when they're ready to go into employment. So um, we're going to talk about that in greater detail as we go forward, but the idea is that you guys don't have to worry about coming up with how you're going to measure that totally on your own. Uh, working with the employer side, the private sector side, and the uh, ICTB staff, State partners will work with you all to give you some checklists that you can use for that. Okay. Here's a very key element to the success of the initiative in that each person will get their own unique plan. We'll want to assess what their academic skills are, uh, their technical skills, and their workplace skills. And the difference between technical and workplace, workplace is, you know, do they know that they need to show up on time? Do they, or do they have the capacity to play well in the sandbox with other employees and their supervisor? Uh, you know, generally, just do they have a good work ethic and the good soft skills that are necessary to, to keep? Of a team approach in looking at folks as they come in. Because someone could come in, and if you weren't familiar with all the nuances of manufacturing, you could go down a checklist and say, okay, do you have X, Y, and Z? And then they could say, yes, I've been a machinist for 30 years, and you know, I know about X, Y, and Z. Okay. But maybe the machining they were doing at that one employer for the last 30 years, or one or two employers, is really not up to speed with what manufacturers expect today. You know, so what we're trying to do is kick the tires on those folks and, and have someone that understands the nuances of manufacturing along with those competency checklists, you know, be part of an interview process and speak to them and tease out the details of like, do they really know what they're talking about? You know, okay, if you, if you ask them, have they run a lathe? Well, yes, they run a lathe. But if you, in the conversation, you could ask them nuances about, about you know, how they used it, you know, what was their processing time, what did they use it for. And once you have that information, you have a much better assessment of what their skill level really is. So, you know, on one hand, you know, we'll have a, you know, the, the standardized competency checklist, but that interview piece is very important. Because what we want to do is structure a training program for them that is tailored to what their needs are, but also for the needs of the region. Um, you're going to have to look at what are the available jobs in the region. You know, four weeks is all they can afford to be, you know, in training before they need to get back to work to support their family. Other families may have a second income or may have greater savings stashed away and. They may be able to stay in training for three or four months, if necessary, in order to get a better job. So you kind of have to look at what's available in the region where you're going to place the people, 
and then also what their situation is to come up with that personalized plan. So if you look at those five items under item A, you know, if you look at all those things and, and, and go through those carefully, you're going to have a pretty good plan for that person that will help them succeed as they go through the program. And again, you know, we'll give you some um, templates and checklists to verify those. As far as assessment tools go, um, we are not going to mandate that anyone use a particular tool. Uh, some folks like WorkKeys, uh, Prove-It is another one that's out there. Uh, you may have their own. There are also some tools in Illinois WorkNet. Um, we will set up some minimum standards that need to be followed. So as long as the program or the tool you're using meets or exceeds those standards, then, then we're fine. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you know, we'll be talking about that as we go through, uh, as we start on the implementation phase. But just so you know, we're going to mandate the tool as long as you meet or exceed the standards. And if you want to exceed them, that's fine with us. Um, you just have to meet our threshold. Then by the end of the training, you know, we want the folks to have a portfolio of work experiences, training experiences, and hopefully stackable credentials that when they go out to an employer, they can show the employer that and it will be meaningful to them. So you know, it's an industry recognized certificate, some MSSC work, uh, some NIM certifications, uh, you know, whatever else it might be. The idea is that you know, they have some documentation in hand that an employer will look at and recognize and say, yes, I see that you've had this and I understand what that means and I know that when I put you to work here that you have the basic skill sets that you need. But also along with that, of course, extensive career coaching and mentoring and as many work-based learning opportunities, opportunities as we can stand, whether it's job shadowing, internships, either paid or unpaid, uh, or OJT um, training itself. Every opportunity you have to get a person that's in the program at a work site where they can kind of see how the work goes and how um, that employer operates is good. Also, every time an employer gets a chance to see an employee or a potential employee, you're setting them up uh, for a much greater opportunity to be hired because they're not in And it's just a much, it's a very efficient way to help uh, grease the skids, if you will, for somebody to go straight into employment. Okay. So we're going to have a little bit of standardization um, instead of the innovation that we've had or that we spoke to earlier that we were hoping to do. We're going to have a little bit of standardization in how folks go through the process. So initially, everybody, once they're led into the program and the random assignment takes place, the treatment group is going to receive that career development coaching services that focus on career exploration, especially related to regional job opportunities. So basically, you've already done your legwork at this point and know the jobs that are going to be coming up or likely to come up in the next few weeks and months in your region. So you're going to explain what those are to the folks and then say, okay, here are all those jobs. Here are the skills that are needed for those jobs. Here's where you've tested out. Here's where your skill, skill level is. And here's the gap that you have for each of these jobs. And then it's up to you to work with that person to say, okay, here's, here's where I'm at. Here's my gap. Here's where I want to be. You know, what's my work plan based on my situation of which path I go down? And then all participants will need to receive MSSC's level one training. That's a manufacturing or introduction to manufacturing and safety. Essentially, that's an applied reading module that is relatively Everybody will get this piece. Okay. Essentially, this was part of our traditional bridge program, and we peeled this off. Uh, so that everybody gets this piece. So everybody that goes through will get a piece of uh, the bridge program as we've known it, but we're going we're to call this um, like an expanded bridge um, aspect of it. Just note that, um, this is LaVon, that uh, Mike had just said about the treatment and then he said all participants, we are now talking about 
the treatment group. Right. So when we say all participants, we're referring to the treatment group. Right. So just as a reminder. Right. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, And then participants that are below ninth and 10th grade on their math and reading uh, can get, take additional bridge coursework and get contextualized learning that's geared toward manufacturing. But once they demonstrate the competency in that, then let's move them up and out. You know, some folks might take four weeks to get to that point. Some folks might take two days or four days. You know? So yeah. And you, some might, might take longer. You know? But the idea is that as soon as they demonstrate the competency, we move them up and out. And then for folks that don't have a high school diploma or a GED, we want those folks to concurrently start work on their GED. And hopefully they finish that before they finish the bridge program aspect. Um, or while they're in training. Uh, and, and finish that up later. The idea is, you know, we don't want to hold them back for that, that paper. Um, but having that paper is good. You know, that's, that will pay dividends for them down the road. So we definitely want them to have it, but we don't want to hold their training up while they're, while they're studying for that test if they've shown that they can do the manufacturing related work. Okay. And again, uh, this kind of highlights the point we made earlier. We want to integrate the classroom work that we're doing and any lab work that we're doing that are giving them technical skills with work-based learning opportunities. So again, every chance we can to get them on site with an employer, you know, we, we want to grab that opportunity. Uh, on the open exit, and you know, we've spoken about that quite a bit, so uh, we'll move on from that. And then the competencies that we're going to speak to and that we're going to have these folks earn are nationally recognized, uh, NIMS level and AWS standards. So again, the idea is that whatever employer they go to in the manufacturing world, they're going to know what these are and understand that the, you know, the person has a valuable skill. And then as many of those credentials that we can stack onto them while they're in training, you know, the better, you know, up to, up to their talent level and capacity to handle. Okay, so that's the big picture. You know, so how is that workflow going to look uh, as we go through the process? So we, this is the big picture uh, from the time that you know, we start looking at them to determine their eligibility and through all the phases we've just spoken about. And we're going to go through each one of these in a little more detail as we go forward. So if the print's a little small to read, don't worry. Um, we're going to hit each as we go a little bit further. And remind me about those because it's an interesting I will. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's in that first box. Right. So um, when we're determining eligibility and aptitude uh, for individuals that are coming into the program, the first thing we need to look at is are they we adult or dislocated worker eligible? Yep. That's the first litmus test. And that's yes or no. If, if yes, great. If no, then you know, you know, just no. You know, they, they can't be let in. So that, that's pretty straightforward. Then we also want to look at what their current math and reading levels are. You know, are they at least at the sixth grade? And the reason they need to be at sixth grade is that by the end of the training period, we want them up to ninth and tenth grade. So the experience has shown if, if you start at sixth grade, you can get up to that level through a bridge program. But if you're below sixth grade, it's going to take you a lot of work and a lot of time to get up to that level. It's not that it can't be done. But it, it, it takes too much time for the amount of time that we have to deal with. Extreme skills. And I spoke to that earlier. Uh, that's where you have the person that is steeped in manufacturing you know, go over the person's uh, record, but also speak to them and tease out those details about what they've done on the job and see where are they really at. You know, uh, the testing will take you so far, but that interview process we think is going to be very, very instrumental in determining where folks' skill level is really at. And that's the key. And then, of course, you know, what are their soft skills and the workplace skills. 
And then finally, for the folks that make it through those first steps, we're going to screen them for drug use. And this is a pass-fail. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is that the employers have told us we will not hire somebody that can't pass a drug test. Okay? So for the purposes of the WIF, you know, we have a little bit more latitude than a regular WIA. You know, we're, we're, just, we're going to weed out the folks that can't pass this because at, at the end of the day, no matter how well they do in the training, no matter how well they do on the test, if they can't pass a drug screening test, they are not going to get a job. And, and that's that. So the drug screening is a pass-fail. And if they fail it, you, know, you can refer them on to treatment programs if they're inter interested in those. Um, but you, they won't be allowed in because they're will pay for the drug screen. So this grant does pay for it. You don't have to come up with that cash out of your own pocket. And then an update to the clarification. I just want to make sure everyone is clear on this. The clarification did say that a high school diploma or equivalent was necessary for enrollment. We are changing that to allow them to work on the GED as they come into uh, the program. Okay. So we'll be updating that shortly, but just so everyone's clear, they don't have to have that. They can work on the GED while they're in. Okay, okay. and then we have a question. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mike, um, you guys can add questions to the chat box. We'll go through all the material, and then we'll come back and hit all the questions at once, because I want to make sure we do get through the material. So. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and, and put them in the chat room, and we will address all of them at the end. Okay, random assignment. Fortunately, that didn't change from, from the uh, last webinar that we did, so really not much new to talk about here. Um, the, state, what, the state evaluator will work with all of us to develop a process that uh, everybody will use. Everybody will use the same process, and once we determine that, we will provide technical assistance to everybody so everybody understands how we're going to go through that. That will probably take the form of a giant meeting in Springfield. Uh, you all can use the WIF uh, grant to pay for your travel here. So that such great importance that we uh, hope to um, um, you know, get everybody on board uh, to the fullest extent possible. Okay, so for the folks then that come in that are deemed eligible and admitted to the program, everybody is going to get this, this uh, treatment. We're going to do that career development exploration, you know, seeing what's out there in the region, then develop that personalized plan for them, and then everybody is going to get that intro to manufacturing and safety. And as soon as they have all of that done, let's move them up and out. Okay. And again, you know, that's also going to take the involvement of um, our um, partners in adult ed, in technical and uh, career and technical education, the WIA case managers. And then also uh, the community college folks asked me to add in something, and I didn't have time to do it, but we will do it out in a final update of the webinar is the Business and Industry Centers. Right. LaVon, can you speak to what yeah. those are and how those could well, help? The Business and Industry Centers are um, the largest providers of public um, workforce training in the state. And so they are out there on the forefront working with uh, primarily manufacturers. So they can be great assistance to all of you in terms of identifying manufacturers, helping to know what, man you know, understanding what manufacturers want, et cetera. And so we just brought in the upfront piece also. So that's all. We just wanted to make sure that they were included in the conversation at your regional and local level. I can get you information on who they are or, you know, send Mike a, a list, et cetera. Okay, and for the folks that aren't at the ninth grade math or 10th grade reading level, then they'll go into what we have known uh, as bridge program around Illinois using the, the definition that we have 
you've spent quite a bit of time and effort developing. Okay, so you know, they can enroll in that, you know, get their math and reading skills up. If they don't have the GED, they can get started on that later. Also get that contextualized manufacturing learning and then the transitional services out into employment. Everybody needs to get that piece. However, if you would like to take it to the next level with folks, you could also give them the MSSC level two coursework, which is quality and measurements, and or the National Career Readiness Certificate. And there are actually, there are four modules under MSSC. There's no reason you can't build all four of them in if you have the time and, and inclination and, and capacity to do that. It would be helpful to the people, but we're not requiring it. Um, we just require folks to have the um, scores up and, and get that contextualized learning and be ready to go into uh, technical training. But again, if you want to do that higher level MSSC stuff, we certainly encourage you to do that because that is another credential they'll have and plus another very valuable skill. Okay, so now uh, once the folks that went through Bridge have caught up with, with the folks that bypassed it and we're entering the technical skill training now. So the key thing here is to work with the employers to determine what jobs are available, which will then help you determine what training you're going to provide. Okay. Uh, we want to work on the pull model where you know, we're meeting the demand and we're not over-training folks for positions that aren't out there. I mean, they might have great aptitude for something or want to enter something, but the, the reality is there are five slots available in the region. There's no need training 100 people for those five slots. Um, another aspect of this that, that is key is that the traditional ITA is not especially well suited for the open exit concept. Um, I mean, just due to the unpredictable timing of it, and ITAs tend to be kind of a onesie twosie type arrangement. And what we're trying to do is run folks through in cohorts. So if you think about um, a tree, think about like a big oak tree if you're starting at the bottom. As you go up that tree, the training everybody is going to get in manufacturing is pretty much the same. specialize out and, and, and look at different industries within manufacturing, then you, know, you have opportunities to specialize in the training. So one possible model is to you know, start with like a manufacturing 101 process that everybody goes through, and then you can kind of branch out folks into specialties um, as they go through the process a little bit more. And again, you know, we want to work that work experience um, in as much as possible. So on the employer side, you know, they're partnering with us uh, along through this. You know, it's not like they're off the table. You, know, you need to be working with those to set up internship opportunities, whether they're paid or unpaid, OJT placement opportunities, and uh, work experience or job shadowing opportunities. So again, the employers need to be part of the conversation at every step of the way. Uh, if they are, this will work out fantastic. If they are not, you know, you're putting a hurdle up that doesn't need to be there. So at the end of the day, after we do all this, you know, we have folks that are ready to go out and get a job. So the last thing to do with those folks is you make sure that um, you know, we know what those current job postings are by working with our employment partners. And then make sure that you match up the person that you're sending with the job. Um, we want to make sure that their skill sets match, if they're a physical, requirements of the job, that those need to be a good fit, and that you know, you've done some coaching on interview skills and have their credential portfolio ready. But the worst thing we could do is send folks through this program and training and send them to an employer for an interview and have them not be a good fit at all for the job, because then the employers will lose confidence in what we're doing. Okay. We want to make sure that you, know, you do that extra legwork and match up the people for the job that you're sending them to interview for so that they have a very good chance of success in that interview. Okay. So then if you put all the pieces back together, that's what it looks like again. And that big blue arrow on the left-hand side is just you know, representing the folks that don't need 
the full amount of bridge programming can jump right ahead to uh, technical skill training. Okay, so what do we do now? At the regional level, since we spoke in December and how you've been approaching all of your regional partners about how you thought it was going to work. So you all now need to go back to your partners and determine the willingness and capacity to proceed down this more standardized path. Honestly, I think this standardized path is very workable and probably has a greater chance of success than all of the individual things that might have been tried individually out there. Uh, not that some of the things might have been better, but overall I think this is a well thought out approach and the national evaluator and DOL agreed and you know, I think it actually has a very good chance of success. So you know, we would encourage folks to come in, but only come in if you're willing to you know, go down this path and, and make sure all the folks are engaged as we go through the process. So I you know, don't want to scare anyone off, but you know, don't come in and, and do it halfway. I mean, we, we need you all committed and, and, and engaged in the process. Part of my role in this whole thing is the uh, regional partnership manager, so that means I'm going to be coming out into the field relatively regularly and meeting with you all and making sure that you know, we're doing everything we can to help you out, but also checking to make sure the progress you're making is, is adequate and are there any stumbling blocks to go along. So uh, those that are you know, decide to come in and that we spoke to you about and then also working with the state evaluator to develop the procedures for enrollment and um, uh, random assignment in the control and treatment groups. So we hope to have all of that done in time still to get grants out to you with a start date of June 1. Okay, having said that, that's pretty optimistic, but that's still our goal that we're shooting for. Um, we would want folks to enter into training very quickly after that, you know, as soon as um, the end of July of this year uh, for the first, first folks being in some kind of training. And then we would like to have the training wrapped up you know, around June of uh, 2015. Then that gives us a year to do the evaluation. So as we go through the process and you think about how many folks that you need to enroll in your region, we're going to have to think if we don't enroll enough people in the first wave or two, you're going to have to look and see how those folks can finish up their training by around June of 2015. So if they need a lot of bridge work and then a lot of technical training, those folks may or may not be a good fit as we you know, get closer to that training deadline. So that's something we'll all keep our finger on the pulse of and work together to make sure that The evaluation we, criteria that we will use for your application uh, is relatively straightforward. It will be all the items that are in the original RFA. Then we will also want to see uh, in your narrative approach that you understand the overall service delivery model the way we've described it here today and it is also included in clarification one. We want to see that you understand those three key features of uh, that model and describe for us the types of training, your service delivery strategies, what you're going to use for your credentialing, if you know it by then, and hopefully you know it by then, and then how those steps are going to address your employer need. A very key thing is your level of employer involvement. If you can name me employers specifically and name folks at that employer that you're dealing with, that's a much stronger application than saying you're going to work with manufacturers in your region. Okay? So the more detail you can give us on that, so much the better. Uh, much stronger application if we know those folks are uh, on board and you know their name and they know yours and they are all uh, agreed to work together with us on this going forward. And also we want to look at your strategy and commitment to the open exit uh, concept and, and uh, the um, doing the concept of cohorts and running people through uh, very quickly as possible.
not much acceleration. So you know, that'll be very key to see how you folks intend to implement that. And then, of course, uh, how you intend to implement the workflow that we just went through uh, in relatively good detail. Okay. So that is the end of the presentation piece. Let's go back and hit the questions that people submitted. And we will start up with Michael Sloan. Between work experience and internship. Um, uh, yes, uh, work experience basically is uh, it could be paid or unpaid, and it is for the people to go be at a work site performing tasks. Okay. Um, at least traditional work experience is that way. There are other things that are a work experience that we'll speak to, but traditional work experience is going to a work site and performing tasks that are supervised. So those may or may not be related to manufacturing. Uh, hopefully they are. But it could also be filing. It could also be um, you know, a myriad of other office tasks. But at least it gets somebody in the door to see what a manufacturing environment is, is about. And it gives that employer the opportunity to kind of assess what kind of work ethic and what kind of personality that person might have. So if they're taking advanced training, even that work experience that they're out there doing something that might be unrelated to manufacturing, but at least with a manufacturing employer, still can pay significant benefits. have to be, um, but if they are, so much the better. Um, and of course, under OJT, we're expecting them to be trained in the occupation that they will end up in. And the idea with the OJT is, you know, the person hires them on the payroll, we provide the training, and then if they successfully complete the training, they remain on the payroll. Okay. Um, yes, the grant can reimburse employers for uh, uh, internship and or uh, OJT costs and uh, for work experience. Um, the question was raised on the webinar we did Friday, like, can we pay for the folks to take the training? Um, and the answer to that is no. No, we do not pay for class time. That, that is against WIA regs. Um, but we certainly can pay for the work experience uh, aspects of it. So the idea is we're not paying them. We're not paying an incentive to come and sit in class, essentially. We're not paying for them to come to class. So we will pay for them to do uh, work-related tasks at an employer. Okay. Paige asks, oh, I lost it. Uh, why is drug screen screening at the end and not at step two? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the thinking on that was, and, and to answer your uh, next question first, the WIP program will pay for the skill assessments and verification, all of that for the people in the treatment group, um, or before that they are randomized. I mean, um, we'll pay for them to be assessed on the front end. Treatment group. Uh, the reason we put the drug testing at the end is that those are relatively expensive, and we thought, let's save the funding for that expensive piece you know, to, before we make sure they're eligible and a good fit for the program. However, your point about that, since that's a yes, no, or a pass, fail, and the other things other than we have eligibility may not be, uh, especially on the kicking of the tires, because that's, that's kind of a random, um, not a random, but more of a, a, a assessment that uh, requires that interview set. We would need to look and see what the, your cost of doing those other assessments are. I mean, we're going to provide you the templates to use, so there's no cost to do that. Um, if you have costs that you incur to do tape tests or other testing um, that are involved, I mean, again, those are going to be paid for out of the WIF grant, not out of your own pocket. But if the test for the drug test is less than doing all those other things, we could look at moving the drug test up. Uh, soon because that is a pass fail. So we'll have conversations with everybody about that to verify, you know, where are we really saving money at? Because if they can't pass the test, you're right. That's an excellent point. There's no need to pay for the testing on other, the other piece as well. So we'll determine what the cost uh, for each of those steps are. And the, the whole goal is to do the thing that was cost effective. 
So if doing it another way is more cost effective, we'll be happy to take a look at that. Will it cost colleges? Cost related to doing it, you can charge it to the WIF grant. Um, it's an applied reading test. Your bridge instructor should be able to apply the MSSC level one um, um, uh, coursework and test. That might even be an online test. But even if it's not, it, it, it's been described to me as a very straightforward applied reading coursework and test. So it should not take very long to do or be very difficult to implement. Given that this is a scientific, yes, true, I'm wondering this. We are working with, Jill, did, did we give a specific hypothesis to DOL that's in writing? I don't believe that I don't think it's as simple as one general statement, but it's a matter of looking at the outcomes that are a part of this to say this is what we expect to happen. Right, right. We um, Obviously, our overall goal and the one that DOL liked and the national evaluator liked was can we find innovative ways to reduce the time to earning for employers? And in fact, there actually are four expected outcomes that are in the clarification. will have higher employment retention rates, but they will accumulate more earnings over the project time period, and then will achieve higher training completion rates. So the idea is that you know, if we do this screening work on the front end to find folks that are better suited to manufacturing than not, and then also accelerate the time it takes them to get through the training, we're going to have better outcomes on getting folks in, on their earnings, and also on the time it takes them to get from enrollment into training. So those are the overall program goals. We don't have it stated as a hypothesis yet. Um, we'll probably be developing that and working with the state evaluator uh, very shortly here. But for right now, those are the four key things that we're, we're targeting. So I hope that's uh, a helpful answer for that question. <clears throat> I'm just trying to mouse around with my screen here to, uh, to That is correct. The last sentence is correct. Yeah. And we, we, we understand that. Well, and a, again, if what, what we want to show here is that the folks have shown the competency that they need to move to the next level. So because the MSFC step one, the intro to uh, manufacturing and safety is a required level, they cannot move on before they show the competency in that test and in that material. So even if they are able to get their reading and math skills up very quickly, they still have to show competency in that first MSFC credential before they move forward. I forgot I have the arrow down here, sorry. Yes, the WIP grant can pay for recruitment activities. We know that you will have to cast a very wide net to get folks that are eligible um, in the program. And then beyond that, we know that some of the folks that you know, are deemed eligible are going to be peeled off into the control group. recruit 
folks into the program. You know, we just ask that you do that judiciously and in partnership with your manufacturers um, as well. Because one of the things that historically we know is that the manufacturing has an image problem in that um, some folks, you know, don't see the value in it because you, they see the headlines in the newspaper or the news and just all they see are the closing. But they don't see that manufacturing is changing. They don't see that there are still opportunities there. They don't see that you know, there are job postings that are available. And, and they don't see that manufacturing still pays a lot of money. So I know that the Learning Exchange has a lot of information on that that will be available to help you market manufacturing to folks in, in your region. And you know, we'll be asking folks to take advantage and leverage that resource as well. Do all services have to be procured since it isn't an ITA? Uh, yes, everything has to be procured. Um, we have um, but procure it. Now, the community college, if if they do the bridge piece, but no other vendor does, then you know because the bridge is a key element of the training, you, that potentially could be a sole source. You need to follow your own local procurement policies when you procure these services, but just because you've mentioned somebody in a grant doesn't mean that there aren't other people out there that could provide the same service that need to be given the opportunity to bid on it. Okay. So I'm, I know that's a little con confusing, but, you know, We've been told very clearly that you know, procurement is in place for this as, as it is for everything else that needs to be done or that, that we do. So you know, just because you mentioned someone in your grant proposal doesn't necessarily mean that that absolves you from the procurement process. But again, you know, if you do the sole source route, that is a procurement process. You just have to document how the people or how the organizations that are involved in providing your services were selected. You know, as long as you do that and it, passes muster uh, with the monitors, you know, so you know, we're fine with that. Okay. In the original FAA, there was a selection of describing innovation strategy. Okay, uh, good question from uh, Jennifer on how to describe the innovation strategy. What we'd ask you to do is describe how you would implement the strategy that we've laid forward. You know, so with that, you know, we're looking for, do you have employers lined up? What kind of jobs do you have uh, people plan to go into? You know, how are you, going, how are you going to put the pieces together? What, what assessment tools are you going to use? Um, basically, give us the details on how you're going to implement each of those boxes that are in that workflow. Uh, no, we didn't take spring break schedules into account because we don't care about the semester calendar. This whole initiative is, you know, um, you know, a little bit off the board. Now, the colleges do, you know, have their, you know, people out of staff. I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. You know, it's not that we don't care, but um, in order for us to get our paperwork turned around, you know, with DOL and get the grants issued on time. You know, we had to go with a date that's at the end of March. So, you know, sorry for any. And we're not going to give ourselves time to review the applications that are coming in, and work with the statewide evaluator to make sure that everything is as it needs to be. Because um, frankly, even though DOL was part of the delay we're still going to be held to standards of getting this out quickly. And, and it's been several months since the project started, so we just want to make sure that, you know, we're doing this as quickly as humanly possible. So, um, you know, that kind of is what it is with the calendar. Um, any change to the number? Um, well, the amount of money we still have is the same. And, um, it just depends on you all, you know, on how you come in. So we're not expecting anything different. You know, we hope that, you know, everybody finds a way to make it work. So 
you know, if your heart's in it and you have the capacity to do it and everybody that is at your table in the region is, is in full agreement on, on how to go forward, by all means, come on in. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you gave us a region that is, you know, you know, a few folks that were part of it before aren't now, you know, you know, you might want to rethink. Uh, taking that one step further, though, you know, some of the folks came in with relatively large groups of local workforce areas. If due to this change, you know, an area or two wants to drop out, but three or four still want to continue on, you know, that's fine too for those folks that want to continue on to come in for a grant. You know, but we're still you know, expecting you know that four to six number of grants uh, to go out at, by the time we're done with all of this. Okay, that is the last, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that role has not been modified. We still believe that the project manager is a key piece to successful implementation, um, and here's why. Traditionally, programs like this have been government-centric, especially a training program that might be even WIA-centric or may have been community college centric, depending on the funding source. What we're trying here is a process that makes it employer centric. Okay? It's the employer's needs that they've identified for us on the front side. It's the employer helping us screen the candidates that are coming in. It's the employers helping us with placement opportunities for work experience, OJTs, and internships. And it's employers eventually they're going to be hiring the folks that come out of the whole process. Okay, so we want a project manager that understands the programs together and can be the point person that deals with the state partners for whatever is going on and also be a good liaison to the manufacturing learning exchange and the individual employers in your region that are participating. And again, we spoke about this back in the bidders conferences. I want you all to think about that person like the football or baseball commissioner. It's beholden to all of the partners that are in the, the, the process. You know, beholden to all of the partners that are at the table. That way, it's not one particular program that is driving the bus. Now, every particular program needs to be at the table and setting those parameters on saying, well, our program is responsible for this piece, and here are the parameters that, you know, that we need to work under. Now, again, because this is innovation, we're challenging you to uh, think outside the box on some of those parameters, open exit being a very prominent one in this, in this uh, process. But if you can find ways to work together, like the community colleges providing credit courses for open exit work, okay, how can we and the community colleges and the employers work together to make that happen? Okay. Can't do it back to us. If a problem has come up, you know, your first role is. All the partners get together with that project manager and see what you can work out. So that project manager is all a little bit more also of a regional mediator. You know, if folks at the table can't agree on a, on a process or have differences of opinion on a process, that project manager is a resource you have locally to help you kind of work through those issues. And then you know, if you get to an impasse with that person who is actually, you know, that's on your team. You folks are hiring that project manager. That's your person you're hiring. So if you still can't work through it with that person, then the state partners can get involved and see what assistance we can provide. So you know, I you know, respectfully disagree that that's not a needed entity. And from our perspective at the state level, that is a very key uh, component of the whole process, and um, we're not going to move away from that. Um, 
The employer-centric manager may be relatively expensive. Um, we can give you additional guidance on kind of what we were thinking salary-wise. I know, I mean, Jill, correct me, I mean, I think we were thinking in, in the maybe the 50 to 75,000 annual range, perhaps. But, you know, if it's a little higher than that, you know, that is what it is based on, on the, the person that has the skill set and your ability to find someone that's willing to take the job. But, you know, college that has no experience, you know, we understand that you are going to have to pay for that expertise, but that's a good investment in the overall project because we believe that's a key piece to helping make this successful. So we're looking at that as a good investment. Where should this person be housed? Um, wherever you get. Yeah, I mean, it could be housed wherever most partners have access to, uh, where you have the space available. Uh, the Manufacturing Learning Exchange may be able to work out some space availability working with employers in, in the region. Um, the space was available at an Illinois Workman Center. There's no reason they couldn't be there. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter as long as you all have access to that person. So wherever you can work out um, would be great. Um, how can the role be sustained after the WIC if it's not embedded in the organization? Um, well, what you'll have to look and see is at the end of the day, did that person bring enough value to the process that it's worthwhile to sustain? It's not intended to be a permanent position, so don't think of this as empire building. This is getting a person on board that will be beholden to all of the partners that will be at your beck and call to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks and everything that needs to be filed with the state is filed correctly, all the reports are handed in proper, properly and on time and basically helps you know, job goes away unless all of you partners have seen this person really knows what they're doing, is really adding value to the process. We've figured out a way to keep on doing this in our regular uh, programmatic uh, way that we're approaching things. And if you can find funding to do it locally among all your sources using braided funding, by all means, feel free. Um, I'll just throw something out, too. You might want to think about um, looking at individuals. We've done this for our Highway Construction Careers Program that are retired from the industry. Um, and may, you know, and one area that you, utilizes several of those that, that could be helpful to you would be, once again, your business and industry centers and, and because they use a lot of consultants for training. And they may have um, links or names for you, so, you know, of people that you, you could identify. This is just uh, helpful to get it moving. Right. And also the Manufacturing Learning Exchange. And the Manufacturing, yeah. Is available to help you locate that person. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we have lots of resources right. for you right. to, to uh, find some folks if you haven't already. But I would encourage you, uh, if you do plan to come in for a grant, be thinking about now with your partners of who you might approach organizations that you can speak to. Uh, if you have employers at the table already, um, that will make yeah. that process much, much easier. The project manager needs to be on as soon as. So you know, that, that's the really step beginning. one yeah. is, is hiring that manager because that manager is going to be working with, with you all, it's going to be working with the state partners, it's going to be working with the state evaluator. Going to meetings. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, that person is going to be very busy on the front end of this. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's a resource um, that's dedicated to this that should be very, very helpful to everybody. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'll wait a second here and see if anybody wants to start typing. But you guys have raised good questions today, too. I would just say uh, there are a lot of uh, community colleges on the phone today. 
if you if you have particular community college questions about this, please feel free to contact me. I'm sure you all have my email. So anyway, um, not to supersede the overall team, but I just meant if it's something specific to a community college, then I can relay it back to, to DCEO. Streams, different systems trying to work together. So we've tried to leave, you know, that, I don't want to say chain of command, but that communication channel that you guys all are familiar with in place. And at the state level, we're all getting together and, and this sharing that up. info. Yeah. So um, that way, you know, the folks that understand what questions to ask when you raise an issue are involved in this so that, you know, we all get to the, the end of what the right answer is much quicker uh, working together. So if there are no other questions, I will call everyone's attention to the original RFA, page five. And that is where we have dot pointed out kind of the roles that were envisioned for each type of partner. And those are you know, still in place. So if anyone is shaky about that or anyone kind of saying, well, you don't need to do that, you know, please refer back to these. And, you know, we just want to remind everybody, you know, employers are definitely along at every uh, step of the process. And, um, you know, if we take care of that, you know, we've covered a lot of ground that hasn't been tried before, at least on a systemic basis and a sustained basis. So, um, I, don't know. I don't know about you all, I'm excited about this. I think that we have landed on a way that is innovative, yet also very doable. And I think at the end of the day, if we can get this open exit thing to work, and especially if we can get it to work with credit, that, you know, we've got something that will be pretty fantastic here. But again, you know, no pressure to make it happen on credit, but, you know, if, if we can, so much the better. But, you know, I'm excited. I think that we can do a lot of great things together here. Questions have come up. Well, Mike's typing now. Okay. Well, seeing that no other questions have come up, we'll close it down now. Uh, if any questions come up later, uh, please submit them to the Illinois WorkNet Q&A page uh, because it is a competitive process. You know, we want to make sure that everybody sees all the questions and all the answers. Right. And the questions that have come up on Friday's webinar and the webinar today will be uh, added on there already if um, the question isn't there or if the answer isn't there already. So. Uh, with that in mind, we again thank you for your participation, wish you all good luck, and we look forward to seeing